would just like you to give a brief introduction about our speaker today and uh, as an English language instructor at the leading national academy in Saudi Arabia. She has been part of the Niagara family in three different locations which are the Niagara College in Mecca, the leading national academy in Al Fubur and Tehran in King Abdullah Economic City. Um, and she's also the Aya Tafel Global Issue, Issues Month Coordinator and the Chair of the TESOL International Professional Development uh, Professional Council and a member of the TESOL International uh, Women Worship and ELT Committee. She's also serving as a TESOL International New Member Guide um, and is also a British Council ELT on Award judge, and she has served as a National Geographic Advisor in 2020. Um, her most recent uh, achievements were being selected as a TESOL International in 2021 Leadership Mentoring Program Award recipient and a TESOL International Convention Ambassador. Um, we're very glad that you could join us today, Hend, and we're really excited for your session today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Yeah, um, <laughs> the floor is all yours now. Great, thank you. So can you uh, see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, yes. great. So uh, my session is titled Lifelong Learning Skills in the 21st Century Classroom. And uh, um, as mentioned, these are some of the associations that I'm part of. I work in Saudi Arabia, Lana Academy. And I'm going to talk about uh, um, employability. I'm going to link it to the six C's of learning. And um, these are skills that are important to be um, for any job and in any um, uh, it's teaching institution. So as we know that the job market is changing today and we're always updating our curriculum and focusing on new skills, new strategies um, to help students excel in their workplace. Um, this helps them get jobs and it avoids redundancy. So employability skills are personal qualities that, that make you employable. Uh, they're sometimes called soft, soft skills or transferable skills because they separate your technical knowledge and work experience and they can be applied to almost any job in any industry. And um, these skills include communication skills, honesty, teamwork, strong work ethic, flexibility and adaptability. Um, so these jobs are um, job readiness skills, these skills that we need to uh, include in our uh, teaching um, are necessary for every job and they're essential attitudes that allow you to grow in your career. Uh, normally we just focus on teaching content, teaching English, maths, um, uh, but these skills are even more important than the technical skills. Connecting and they include connecting with co-workers, solving problems, uh, being part of your team and understanding your role within your team, making good choices, being independent and taking charge of your career, not just waiting for somebody to tell you what to do. So these personal characteristics, habits, attitude, they influence how you interact with others. Um, employers value these skills and these show how you can get along with your teammates, with your managers and your clients. So these skills are very important and they lead to career success. So what do we need to do as educators? We need to ask ourselves two important questions. How can educators prepare students for the job market? And how can we help students develop these employability skills? Uh, the solution to this question is the use of six C's of education. Uh, the six C's are modern day skills and they play a major role in setting students up to success, for success and work and making sure that they thrive personally and professionally. So as educators, we need to rethink our existing curricula to help students build 21st century skills that will help them in the workplace. Um, I'm not saying that 
maths and technical vocab and all that is not important. It's very important. But in addition to that, we need these skills, um, 21st century skills that help them in the workplace. So in the chat box, I'd like to ask you to give examples of 21st century skills that your students need. What skills do you think your students need to succeed in the workplace? So I'll give you uh, two minutes. If you can type in the chat box, what skills do you think your students need? Coding, yep. Soft skills, absolutely. What else? Exactly, these are the exact skills that I'll be talking about. Critical thinking, creativity, teamwork, communication, uh, interpersonal skills, great, great comments in the chat box. Thank you. Collaboration skills, absolutely. And that is exactly what I'm going to be talking about in the session now. So yes, these skills are very important. And um, we don't really think about these skills when you're, you're, our kids go to schools. We don't really think, oh, they need to learn uh, these uh, communication skills. They do, we do need to teach them these skills. Um, they don't just, they're not just automatic. They do need to be taught and there are different ways to help our students and, uh, and children develop these 21st century skills. So um, first I'm going to talk about the 20th century, the framework for the 21st century learning. So if you can see in the picture, the class is very dull. All the students are sitting very close to each other. The teacher is the, sa uh, is, is the sage on the stage and uh, it focuses mainly on assessment and core subjects. And that's how our parents used to learn. Just, um, they teach them English, math, science, they test them, they move to the next class and so on. So it didn't really help them develop those skills that you mentioned in the chat box. So, and even traditional teachers, they used to lecture. Um, if we look at classes today and classes, um, 20 years ago, they're very different. Teachers were the sage on the stage. We teach, they used to teach to the test. Um, this is a video, but I'm, I'm not gonna play the video. This is what was in the video. Uh, teachers sit in the lounge and complain, teach one year 25 times. And if you know people uh, who are um, you know, more experienced or who taught a long time ago, you'll find that they, this is what, you know, if you ask your grandparents, they'll probably tell you that they used to teach one class 25 times, um, no use of computers, uh, using chalk, um, cover rather than uncover material, and just wanting to go to the next level and become administrators. Uh, so that it, that's what it was like in the past. Now, this is what our classrooms look like today. So we still have assessment, but it's 21st century assessment. We still have core subjects, English, math, science, geography, and all the main subjects that we used to teach our kids or students a long time ago. In addition to those, now it's not only focusing on just the subjects, but it's 21st century content, teaching life skills, learning and thinking skills, ICT literacy. And we really realized the importance of ICT literacy when we moved to our online classes due to the pandemic. So let's look at what these teachers said about uh, 21st century learning. When I become a teacher, I want, to, um, I want to edit, remix, and share media with my students, learn from my students, um, create my own personal learning network, and that is like different uh, associations, um, and Webinar Down, TESOL International, IATEFL, joining uh, communities of practice. I won't fear technology, I'll embrace it, creating a positive learning environments, project-based learning, um, edit, remix, and share media with my students. And this is very interesting because during the uh, Saudi National Day celebration, uh, we took lots of pictures and my students made a really nice video. So yes, we do learn from our students and we do um, uh, edit media and share um, things with our students. 
So now I'm going to talk about the four C's. I'm, I'm going to talk about the four C's and how they developed into the six C's. Since the late 1990s, educators and policymakers have been discussing the need for 21st century skills. The partnership for 21st century skills defined these as four C's, which are critical thinking, which you mentioned, creativity, communication, and collaboration. And I'll talk about each one of these in a little more detail. So let's start with the first one, which is communication. Sharing thoughts and ideas and solutions. And that's what we're doing right now. And uh, in the technological age, it's easier, but it's a lot harder as well. So technology made things um, more convenient, but at the same time, it's overwhelming. Um, normally, at the beginning of any presentation, I'm really worried about the technology not working, my mirror, my screen sharing, my connection. So it can be really overwhelming. Um, and it can be more about the technology used rather than the actual message. Uh, without effective communication, there is no way to get anything done. The next C, which is collaboration. It's also working together to reach a goal. And of course, we know technology has made communication a lot easier. However, some breakdowns can happen. Uh, for example, the number of choices can get overwhelming and the actual collaboration gets lost while we pay too much attention to the tool rather than the actual collaboration. As this world gets more interconnected, collaboration will be a more and more essential skill, skill than it is today. Critical thinking, which is looking at problems in a new way and learning across different subjects and discipline, connecting different subjects across curricular learning. And it's been essential in every uh, century, in every profession, and it helps students make sense of present content and apply it in their daily lives. Um, another issue with technology is if we let the technology do the thinking for us and depend 100% on technology, that's a major issue. Um, we need to know that no matter how advanced the machine is, it's useless without a person telling it what to do. The fourth skill is creativity, and creativity is um, trying new approaches to get things done, innovation and invention. Uh, the 21st century is a fun time to be creative, thanks to technology. There's so many things that we can do on Snapchat, Instagram, so many different apps, so many different exciting tools. Um, so we don't only have the traditional ways of learning, but we also have so many new possibilities. Um, like something that you can find on um, uh, Snapchat. Instead of painting a picture, you can animate it or arrange a piece of music on a computer without even learning how to play. So it's up to us to utilize our own thinking power and technology at hand to get the creative project done. So now um, we mentioned the four C's of learning, but the four C's are not where these C's are ending. Uh, Professor Michael Fullen uh, stated that um, students need to need more than just basic 21st century skills associated with the four C's. They, what, what else do they need? They need in, intrinsic desire to learn, grit, capacity to empathize with others, perseverance, emotional intelligence, and so much more. So, and, and these are defined by Michael Fullen as deeper learning competencies. And um, he said that the four C's need to be developed to the, into six C's to make it complete. So what are the two additional C's that were added by uh, Michael Fuller? Uh, the two C's were character education and citizenship. So what are these two skills? Uh, citizenship mean, uh, citizenship and culture, and these two go hand in hand. Citizenship and culture focus on being in touch with everything that surrounds the individual. Um, something very interesting that we talked about previously in our woman mentorship in ELT, uh, we wrote a book chapter about um, the, how our culture and how citizenship and our previous experiences shaped our personalities and helped with our leadership journeys. So this has an impact on, on, you know, your whole uh, life. 
Character education, which refers to the individual essential, uh, refers to qualities that are important for uh, surviving in a complex world. And these are grit, perseverance, ability to empathize, and so many others. If you can see the picture, gratitude, enthusiasm, respect, curiosity, uh, in independence, and so many others. So the Partnership for 21st Century Skills has developed a unified collective vision for 21st century learning that can be used to strengthen education. So as we saw previously, it was just assessment and core subjects, and now it's 21st century assessment and core subjects in addition to learning and thinking skills, ICT literacy, 21st century content, and life skills. So I want to talk briefly about each one of these skills. Uh, life skills, um, it's important to incorporate life skills in um, schools and into our curriculum. Um, it's teaching them things that they need to know in order to survive in their real world, things that they will face when they start their, their jobs. Then we have um, 21st century content. So the material that we teach our students is really important. It has to be something that's related to what's happening around them. Global awareness, financial, economical, and business literacy, civic literacy. And these connections are important to encourage student engagement, motivation, and attitudes towards learning. And these, you can do these through um, field trips, through um, certain activities like um, breast cancer awareness campaigns, uh, no smoking campaigns, just basic things that help them understand um, recycling, understand more about what's going on around them. Four subjects. So, of course, that does not mean we don't, we don't teach our students the main subjects, which are English, math, science, geography, history, um, civics, economics, all these are still important and they need to be incorporated in the curriculum as well. Um, element four is learning and thinking skills. So, um, as we said, they do need to learn academic content, which is what we mentioned, English, math, science, and the basic subjects. They also need to know how to keep learning and make effective and innovative use of what they know throughout their lives. Um, so learning skill, and this is, they need two things, learning skills and thinking and reasoning. Learning skills, which is through information and um, ITC technology, um, uh, sorry, ITC communication, information media literacy, visual literacy, innovating communication, and they need to, they need thinking and reasoning, which is critical thinking, problem solving, and creating. So uh, ITC literacy is very important, and we all have noticed how important it is during the pandemic. Uh, we all struggled at the beginning, moving from different platforms and trying to navigate these platforms and mirror our screens but it really helped a lot. Um, the, it's, it's the ability to use technology to support 21st century teaching and learning. And there was something important that we learned from the pandemic is that these skills using technology in the classroom um, is not only during the pandemic, but now we use them inside the classroom, face-to-face -face classrooms as well. In a digital world, students need to learn to use tools to master learning skills that are essential to everyday um, and workplace productivity. Our students are millennials and they learn through technology. So it's very important uh, for them. To, it's important to have interactive activities and uh, you know, like Quizlet, Kahoot, and things that engage them because this is how they learn. 21st century assessment. So not old fashioned exams, but using high quality assessments that measure students' performance for the elements of a 21st century education. Um, student engagement and 21st century skills. Student engagement is very, very important. And it's a sign when students are engaged, that means they're learning. And um, any school uh, focuses mainly on student engagement in the classroom. Um, so, and this is a very important quote. Teach me and I forget. Um, uh, to, sorry, teach me and I forget. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. And it's very interesting because I'm a type of, I need to be involved to learn. So um, 
we have a lot of students who are like that as well. So now I'm going to talk about some misconceptions about 21st century uh, learning. Um, there's um, certain misconceptions. So the first one, first myth, is that 21st century skills focuses only on technology. And that's not true. It focuses on meeting the students' needs of their world. And that can be done through technology. So it's just a tool that is used to help them meet the needs of their world. Uh, critical thinking is thinking hard and doing puzzles. And sometimes when you think about the word critical thinking, you do think that it's probably just puzzles or complicated uh, quizzes and activities. That's not true. It's part of it, but they are uh, important skills that need that are um, important in 21st century learning. And it focuses on problem solving, making judgments, reasoning, thinking. So even when they get these complicated puzzles, it's not just to get them to do a puzzle, but to, to solve problems, to think, to um, find creative ways of reaching solutions. Collaboration and communication mean working in groups. That's not true. Collaboration and co uh, collaboration communication mean communicating coherently, valuing diverse ideas, and tailoring message to audience to achieve a common goal. Myth number four, creativity is only for artists. That's not true. Uh, creativity helps all students think creatively, implement innovations, and work to work uh, um, creatively with others. Now, question. Can you give examples of 21st century skills uh, that your student that your students um, need? Sorry, the question is, can you give me examples of some uh, activities um, that are used um, that incorporate 21st century uh, teaching and learning. What kind of activities or or uh, projects would you do with your students that help students develop these 21st century skills? Have you got any any names of different activities or tasks or or games that uh, are used to uh, help them develop these uh, skills? Uh, yep, dubbing. Yes, uh, subtitling. Okay. Okay. Any any, any other skills? Any other activities or games that you use that help your students develop these skills? Any projects? Uh, creating videos? Uh, yeah, charades. Excellent. Yeah, that's true. I use charades too. Creating videos, uh, word wall. Yeah, vlogging. True. Yeah, these are all fun activities that can be used in the classroom and help students develop these skills, although they won't even know that they're developing these skills, but they really uh, help them. Uh, uh, yes, Kahoot quizzes, uh, debating. My students are working on projects, war and racism, natural resources. Yep, FGM, exactly. And these are what you just mentioned. They're linked to um, real life um, situate things that happen in real life. So it's linking um, the world to the students and taking the students out to the world. That, that's great. So I'm going to talk about some uh, project activity Clue, yep, that's true. Uh, thank you for your input. So I'm gonna talk about some activities that help students develop these 21st century skill, skills. And one of them, which is really fun, is called the Jigsaw. So the Jigsaw is a cooperative learning strategy where students work in groups and each group takes a chunk of content and teaches it to other members of the group. And then at the end, they all fit their individual chunks to form a complete body of knowledge. And it's a great deal of fun. Um, and as I said, students won't even know that they're learning, but they will really, really, and they'll really, really enjoy it. So what you do, how to form a jigsaw. I'm gonna talk about how to form a jigsaw. Um, so if you have uh, five different topics, um, I'm just gonna give an example about grammar, but you wouldn't really teach grammar that way, but um, let's say you have uh, present simple, past simple, present continuous, past continuous, and future tense. So these are five different topics. So you divide your students into five different groups. Um, every group gets the five topics, and um, um, e so they're in charge of um, dividing it between each member of the group. So you have group A has the five topics and five students. Group B has the five 
etc. So they all have the five topics and they um, are in charge of this topic. So then um, you assign one chunk of content to each person. So in the group, you have one person who's in charge of present, one person in charge of past, one, etc. So they, they, they'll be responsible for teaching their group that specific chunk. So for example, the pink group, I like to divide them into colors, uh, just like the picture. So we have the red group, we have five different topics, and each person is in charge of sitting individually, learning about the content, and um, eventually at the end, they're, have, they're going to have to go and explain it to their groups. Um, so how are they going to know? What if they have questions? What if they have any gaps? What we do, they don't interact with their members of the group. They just sit there individually and study it. Then they meet in expert groups. So each student who's in charge of a uh, certain content um, should meet with all the others. So if you, for example, group A, you have somebody who's in charge of the present tense. Group B, you have someone who's doing present. Group C, group D. And all the people who are in charge of the present tense come together. And these, after studying their content, this is the expert group. So in the expert group, they ask questions because they've all studied the same content. If they have any gaps, if anything's not clear, uh, they help each other. Uh, it's peer teaching. They, um, and if there are any gaps, they're filled. Any misconceptions are cleared up. And any important concepts are reinforced. So it's like a study group where they support each other so they can go back confidently to their main group. So, and that happens with each topic. Um, then they return to their original jigsaw and each one, each group takes turns presenting their chunk of information. The other groups listen carefully, they take notes. And finally, we assess the students on all content. And then you can just have a competition, see which group presented, uh, had the best presentation and, um, uh, which presentation was, was uh, more enjoyable. So it's a fun activity and it can be done with any, any topic and um, it has a lot of advantages as well. Uh, first of all, it's cooperative learning. Uh, it promotes interaction. They interact with their, they, they work individually first and then they work in their small, small groups, the um, expert groups, and then they work in a larger group, so it also helps them become more confident. Um, so it promotes interaction, positive interdependence. They work as a cohesive group to achieve shared learning objectives. Um, individual accountability when they go, when they read their content before they get into the expert groups. Um, group processing by reflecting on the learning, uh, the process of effectiveness and contribution of the members in the group improves and interpersonal and social skills. They work together, they trust each other, they resolve conflicts and they all have a common goal. So it's a great activity and it's a great deal of fun too. Another activity is called the, gen uh, the genius hour. Um, and it's also called the passion hour. Uh, what are you passionate about? It focuses on finding one's passion and building up on it. It's very important because maybe the next invention will come from your classroom one day. Who knows? So it, um, this is where passions come to life. A genius hour is another uh, tool or an activity that uses, that's used in 21st century classrooms. And what you do is you divide your class you can have 80% of your class is for what you do every day, teaching the content, um, and 20% can be for the genius hour. You can use it when you feel that your students are falling asleep. You ask them to talk about whatever it is that they're interested in. It could be anything. Um, uh, makeup, football, basketball, computers, iPads, cars, anything they like. And they're going to go through a whole research process without even knowing that they're learning. And it's really amazing how um you know it's like just bringing uh their passions to life uh, and you'll be amazed um when they get to talk about what they really like to do um they will excel so as i mentioned uh it's uh, there are six principles of the genius hour 80 20 rule which is 80 percent 
uh, for class time, 20% for the genius hour. Uh, and it can be done based on um, how much time you have. Um, it gives them a sense of purpose. It's student centered um, and they, they can talk about what they want, what they like. So it gives them a sense of purpose. Socialization, they connect with peers. So they go around asking questions. Um, they ask experts um, and um, it gives them a sense of purpose. They get to work with their small, they work, work in groups and asking, you know, interviewing their colleagues or um, a questionnaire, a survey, and um, they get to socialize and ask experts about if, for example, if they like football, they can ask somebody who knows more about football, go online, get information, um, at inquiry. So they're going to survey possibility, navigate unfiltered content, they gather information through, inter through the internet, through surveys, um, so they make sense of ideas that are important to them. So after they do that, they create something. They come up with a podcast or a, a, um, a PowerPoint presentation or a role play, anything at all, what they want. It's something that they're going to decide and they come up with something that they like. So they can make a video and it's really amazing how you'll really be amazed. Um, they get to design their own learning. So without teachers packaging content that frames and scaffolds content, they're left to design their own learning experience. Uh, so it's a great activity, it's fun, and it will help you discover um, amazing talents that your students have, and you'll really be amazed. Like I, you can find uh, students who are very quiet, but they have amazing skills and they know how to create videos and um, it's just amazing. So that is the genius hour. And now I'm going to talk about, um, I think it's going to be the last activity, which is called the fishbowl activity. So this activity also encourages collaboration, creativity, communication, critical thinking, which are the four C's. It's a cooperative learning structure for small groups or partner discussions. So as you can see in the picture, this is a fishbowl activity. You have a small group in the middle, and this is the fishbowl, and you have observers who are observing what they're saying in the fishbowl. The observers have certain tasks. They need to, you can ask, you can ask them to pick a certain student um, or somebody in the fishbowl and observe them and see how many times they um, asked questions, how many times they responded, if that person helped um, uh, help give them more information? Did he help develop the conversation? So they're observing each other and that will help them when they get into the fishbowl. So now they're observers, but they're going to switch. And then the ones inside the fishbowl are going to go outside and the one outside are going to go inside. So this is something that you can do with reading, with um, just, you know, brainstorming sessions. So it's fun and um, it gives them a sense of purpose. So how do you do it? You select a topic. Um, if you already have a topic in the book, that's fine. If you don't, you can select a topic and then ask them to sit in small groups and prepare for a discussion, prepare the questions that they want to ask, and you can give them a template and, and with some questions and um, that will help them guide the discussion. Uh, give them a few minutes to prepare these questions in advance. And then they get into their fish bowls you can give them 15 minutes to have a conversation inside the fishbowl while the others are observing and taking notes. And then they're going to switch places. So the ones inside the fishbowl are going to go out and become observers. And the ones who are observing are going to become fishbowl participants. Um, and how are you going to get them to switch? There are two ways. You can use the tap system where they tap each other's shoulders. And that means we need to swap. Or you can just say switch and then they switch places, and um, you can keep doing this more than once. They switch, they tap, move in and out, and um, keep taking notes. So then after you finish, um, after the discussion, you can ask them to reflect on um, how they think the discussion went and what they learned from it. And then they can evaluate their performance 
as participants and as listeners when they were inside, when they're out, and ask them which one they preferred. And um, it's a great deal of fun. And then they can also pick a winner, best uh, uh, person who evaluated and best participant who was very active in the fishbowl and who uh, took a, a lot of notes and answered a lot of questions. Um, okay, we still have time, so I'm going to go to my next activity, which, called, which is called the Think Aloud activity. Think Aloud is a process, um, it's a teaching strategy, and it's used to model how readers think as they read. Normally when we're reading, uh, we just ask the students to read, and then they read without thinking about what they're reading. And it's not just about covering content, but it's about actually thinking about what you're reading. So this is how it's done. So um, it teaches students how to think while they're reading and focusing on what they've read. So, um, for example, um, if they're reading a, a story, it could be a story, it could be something that's technical or academic. Uh, let's take, for example, Cinderella. Uh, once upon a time, there was an unhappy girl named Cinderella. You're, you have your book open and you're reading. And then... Um, to show them that you're thinking about what you've just read, you close the book and say, I wonder what the word Cinderella means. I'll highlight that word and look it up in the dictionary. So you do whatever you want your students to do while they're reading. Do you want them to highlight the words and look them up right away? Do you want them to put a, a post-it uh, on it or a sticky note and um, write down the words? Whatever you want them to do when they're reading, you just... Uh, show them how it's done, you model, and then they learn how to do it. Um, you can also stand on one side of the class with uh, to show that you're reading, and then you move to the other side to show that you're thinking about what you've read. So it's fun, it's interesting, and um, it's funny, when I did it with my students, I had my book open, I was reading, when I closed the book, I started thinking, so they were a bit worried about me, but if you explain, eventually they got the hang of it. So, as I said, you can use post-its. Um, do you want them to stick the words right on post-its? Do you want them to open the dictionary right away? Do you want them to highlight? Whatever you want them to do, you just demonstrate and show them how it's done. So, um, as we said, we have all these different activities that um, um, uh, help our students. But what can I do as a teacher to help my students develop these skills in addition to these activities. Scaffolding. Scaffolding is um, very important and it doesn't matter which level. It refers to a variety of instructional techniques that helps them move towards stronger understanding and ultimately greater independence in the learning process. Uh, we can also say that scaffolding, scaffolding is breaking up learning into chunks and giving them a tool or structure with each chunk. Um, and scaffolding is very important. Um, it helps us meet the needs of diverse learners because we have lots of different learners in the classroom and they all have different backgrounds, different levels of knowledge, different abilities. So um, instead of just giving them something different, um, so this is like comparing differentiation and scaffolding, um, instead of just giving them something different, it's better if we consider how we can provide scaffolding, the scaffolding necessary to ensure that they can work together on a common task or um, text. So, um, as we said, the idea of scaffolding is to provide instruction just beyond what the learner can do by uh, the learners can do by themselves. You provide scaffolds uh, when they can achieve the task. Then you can step back and they work independently on their own. So, in the chat box, if you can just type in. The benefits, what do you think the benefits of scaffolding are? Why do you think it's important to scaffold and give them the support that they need? Um, and uh, can you type in the chat box, what, uh, why do you think it's important to scaffold? Why is scaffolding important? Very good, they work independently and we get to know, uh, we don't just take them as a whole group 
and uh, we get to know their individual um, uh, strengths. I remember when I went to school in the UK, we had colored books and we would just work on our own. Very good, they're student-centered, differentiated instruct in instruction. We had these colored books, the red book, the green book, the blue book. And then when I finish a book, I can go to the next level. I don't have to wait for my colleagues. I just go on my own. My, their a teacher provides it's, you know, scaffolds and uh, supports them individually. So they get more individualized, individualized support from their uh, teachers. And it's uh, very, very uh, useful. I'll just look at a few more ideas. Yeah, student-centered. They work independently. Um, and it is a type of differentiated instruction too. So um, yeah, scaffolding is, is very important and it really helps um, our students. Um, I think we have a few minutes left. I'm just gonna go over uh, some of the advantages here. Um, it helps students maintain steady student interaction. It helps them build upon acquired knowledge and skills. It helps learners move towards new skills, con concepts, or levels of understanding. It minimizes their frustration. It can be used to cool down learners who are easily frustrated when learning with their peers. And uh, they're more engaged, as you said, and they're active in the learning uh, process. Yeah, um, and finally, we have some strategies, scaffolding strategies, using uh, visuals, realia, sometimes use a first language, uh, reading aloud, what I just uh, mentioned previously, modeling, which was also in the reading aloud activity, gestures, working in small groups and partner groups, which was in the uh, um, first activity that I mentioned, the jigsaw, uh, sentence starters, sentence structures, uh, connecting to background knowledge, graphic organizers, and there are so many different ways that you can scaffold and support your students in the classroom. So I think uh, is time up, 45 minutes. Are they up? Yeah. Um, yep, we've got like two more minutes, but um, so if you have, uh, if you wanna wrap up the session, if you have any more info you need to add, um, we still have some time. Okay, so I can uh, go through the steps of scaffolding. Um, so how do we scaffold? First, the instructor does it. The instructor models how to perform a new task. Um, for example, how to use a graphic organizer. You show them how it's done. Um, you, you give them one that's partially completed, a graphic organizer, and ask them to think aloud as they describe how um, the organizer illustrates the relationship among the information contained. Then after the instructor does it, the whole class does it, that's the second step. They work with the instructor to work together to perform the task. Uh, then students might um, give suggestions, brainstorm, how, what they want to add to the graphic organizer, what they want to change. And then you, the, you write the instructions on the board and then they make their own graphic organizers. Third, the group does it. So first it's the instructor, then it's the instructor in the class, then the students on their own. And here they work in small groups, cooperative groups to complete the graphic organizer. And now you can give them a blank one, um, but if depending on the level, of course. Um, uh, so if it's something that's more complex, it might need a little more time and you might need to keep repeating the instructions. And then the fourth stage is the students do it on their own. It's individual, it's independent practice, and students can demonstrate uh, their, their task mastery and um, receive necessary practice to help them perform the task automatically and quickly. So you need to give them the skills to be able to do that. And if you look at the picture, um, getting ready, show me how, help me do it, let me do it by myself, what did I learn? Can Another example, if you cannot ride a bike at the beginning, can ride a bike with guidance and assistance, then can ride the bike. So that is the end of my presentation. And I hope you enjoyed it. And now it's time thank for questions. You. Yeah, thank you so much. And that was really wonderful and really inspiring. And, um, you know, just listening to you, I already like, you know, thinking of ways to incorporate these activities and skills into my classroom. That's perhaps great. next week. Thank you um, so much. So it was really like, you know, 
refreshing as well. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to give some time for questions. If anybody's got a question, um, you can unmute yourself and ask uh, Hind any question, or if you would like to write it in a chat box as well. Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Yes, sure. Am I, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the organizers and to our today's presenter for a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, it was rather sweet, but I was able to catch a bit of a conflicting point when you brought up a, a comparison between what uh, the, the myth and truth uh, says about the collaboration. Well, our, let's say, you kind of challenge it our traditional thoughts of collaboration, like most of us probably were under impression, under assumption that collaboration was simply meant to work together, but it is not. It is not just working together in, in, peer, in, in, in pairs or in, in, in many groups, but it's more like uh, working coherently and in a coordinated fashion, right? So my question is, how do you expect the presence of coordination and coherence in a multi-level and multi-age language learning groups where uh, the sense of unity may seem unattainable? Thank you. Uh Thank you very much. That's a very good question, and that's true. Um, uh, one of the important things is to put students in mixed ability groups, because when they work, and, and they're not going to work with uh, students who are at the same level, right? They're not going to work with um, employers or colleagues who have the same skills, or they are going to work in different settings, in different... Uh, so instead of just putting... Uh, I, I remember when I started teaching... A uh, long time ago, we used to divide our students into less confident learners, average confidence learners, and just keep them there. They'll keep performing at the same level. So that's why if you put them in mixed ability groups, in different groups with different um, you know, backgrounds, different ideas, that is how they learn. And if we think about uh, our, our communities of practice, it doesn't have only uh, certain you know, PhD holders for for example, or uh, professors, we have so many different levels, so many different countries, take TESOL International, for example, so many different levels of understanding. And then when people bring all these different unique ideas together, that makes it um, very special and very um, diverse. And um, people can just share their ideas and that will help them learn. So, and one of the problems, if you just put them in different like levels, based, they will feel it. They will know, oh, this is our group. We're not the we're not the good students. We're the bad students, or we're the low students. But if you pick them in mixed ability groups, they'll pick. They'll learn from the advanced ones, and they will um, uh, they will you know develop by learning from different types of learners, different types of. Uh, um, and it's also very important to learn about the different um, uh, types of learners as well, kinesthetic learners. Uh, visual learners, auditory learners, and having different learners in that group too. So the visual learner can share, can you know, share his style of learning with the team. Uh, the auditory learner can share what he knows. Kinesthetic learner, you know, so that is it's important to have different levels and different uh, mixed ability groups. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll have one more question. I'll just wait for the house. If they don't have any question, then I I'll go for another interesting question. Sure. Um, yeah, go ahead, Firuz, yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, get to know your experience, like in your experience, which one of those four C's or six C's was most challenging to foster in your students, but to bring um, into your classroom? Um, I think um, getting the shy students, uh, you know, communication. Uh, you know how it is when you're in the class, when you're just talking to yourself, <laughs> when you have shy students, and there's also, also the language barrier. Um, um, I teach in Saudi Arabia, and the first language is Arabic, of course, so uh, they're shy and they don't want to talk. But uh, the first thing, the most important thing to break that uh, barrier is to know the student, and you can do that through the genius hour. I had a very, very shy student who wouldn't participate at all, but she was so good at making videos. And so when I gave her that uh, task, it empowered her. And you know, she found her own way 
of expressing herself and communicating. So just getting, and that is also one of the six principles, a TESOL International's book, uh, six principles for exemplary teaching of English uh, learners. The first principle is get to know your learners. So if you get to know your learners, you can know how to reach them and how to, you know, unlock the hidden uh, talent. So in the light of Saudi students, they have no problems with other uh, like C's, like critical thinking, creativity. Uh, it actually, it's, it's not only in Saudi, it's in any classroom. No, uh, given, given your teaching context, I mean, you're, you're now based in Saudi Arabia. So yeah. it's kind of interesting to, to get to know about your part of the world. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, they are very, very creative, um, you know, they, especially when it comes to technology. Uh, making videos. Um, I worked at uh, another Niagara College uh, uh, branch, which was in, in uh, Cake. Um, and um, I, I, I taught uh, aircraft maintenance technicians. So they were so, uh, we did this genius hour activity and they made this incredible video. And, um, and it was also a very shy student, but then he was just really, really, um, like the work that he did with the video was just amazing. And they all got to talk about like, what they're interested in, what they like. So yeah, you just need to tap that, uh, you know, uh, hidden talent and then you, you'll, you'll be amazed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for, for your questions and thank you and for um, all the information that you shared with us. Um, I just want to direct people right now to the link. There is a link shared in the chat box. Please make sure you record your attendance so that we can send you uh, the certificate of attendance. The link is shared right now. It's the last message in the chat box. And um, any more questions? Okay, so um, yeah, All right. thank you again, Hand. Um, that was really, really inspiring, and we kind of needed this kind of like you know to refresh our minds in like you know the most inspiring way. Um, thank you so much again for being with us today, and uh, thank you for everybody who was here and attended, and like you know stuck with us till the very end <laughs> and um, have a wonderful um, day thank you so thank much. you so much thank you i really enjoyed it take care